and a very warm welcome to our 128th Security Thought Leadership Webinar. So the 128 times we've been through this, uh, our chance to find out what's going on in the world. And the idea of thought leadership is we critique today for a better type of security tomorrow. And you know what's special about today is once we finish the thought leadership webinar, you're, in, you're asked to stay with us while we present the Nigerian Oscars. That is the Nigerian Outstanding Security Performance Awards. We're delighted uh, to be in collaboration with SecureX. Um, I'm obviously not taking place this year for obvious reasons, but as you can see, back in May next year, uh, and uh, we'll hopefully be teaming up again with them uh, um, to present the awards next year. Right now, uh, we're going to do the webinar first, and then we're going to present the Nigerian Oscars. So stick with us. And here's the topic. Has the pandemic produced a new type of security, or are things just the same as they always were? Are we expecting things to go back just as they were beforehand, or is it all, all going to change? Today, we've got three experts we're inviting to speak today on this topic. Three panellists, all coming at this from different angles. So in a minute, I'll invite the panellists to introduce themselves. And once they've done that, I will invite each of them to make an opening statement. And of course, after that, I'll invite you, the audience, to ask questions. Please, could you use the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen, Q&A to ask questions, and I'll endeavour to incorporate it. If there's any questions about Nigeria security, Africa security, we'll incorporate it. We've got a bit of noise in the background there somewhere. I'm not quite sure what the noise is, but uh, um, we'll ask Hannah to the agency if we can sort it out. Let's go meet our panelists then. And first of all, let's go to uh, Baduka. Baduka, please introduce yourself. Thank you, uh, Martin. Uh, my name is Bodifa Julia Johnson. I am the Managing Director of EPSS Private Security Services Limited. I am so delighted to be here with you all. Thank you. Baduka, thank you. and a pleasure to have you and looking forward to hearing your views. Uh, let's now go to Kabir. Kabir, please introduce yourself. Um, thank you, um, Professor Martin. Uh, my name is Kabir Adamu. I'm the Managing Director of Beacon Consulting Limited. Uh, we provide security risk management services in Nigeria and the Sahel region. I'm delighted to be here as a panelist. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And now let's go and meet Dauda. Dauda, please introduce yourself. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Dauda Hageni. I'm the Managing Director of Unity Integrated Security Services with offices in Nigeria, uh, mostly uh, servicing um, offices and um, have been in the industry for quite some time, close to 30 years. So I'm here and I'm highly delighted to be here this afternoon. Thank you very much indeed. Well, they're our panelists. As you know, the object now is to hear what they've all got to say about this subject here of Nigeria security. What's been going on and where is it all going? So we ask each of them three minutes to give their views. Don't forget, if you'd like to get a question in about Nigerian security generally, African security perhaps, um, um, never a better time. Do get the question in early. Use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and I'll try and include, include that question when we have the discussion afterwards. Without further ado then, let's go back to Baduka. And Baduka, please give us your opening statement. Thank you, Martins. Uh, before the pandemic, uh, we've always... Uh had a, a different security issues in Nigeria. And uh, there's an impression, you know, a wrong impression created that the government can single-handedly create sustainable distribution of food and, and provide for the economy. And uh, looking at the, the factors, you know, uh, that uh, the pandemic uh, has brought in, uh, there has been no, there hasn't been any significant change in the security formation, I would say, but, what has really changed in the security trend is the new development, the physical assault, the denial of service, eviction from homes, cyber attacks, psychological threats, and all the other things that uh, uh, we've always had, like militancy issues, kidnapping. These are things bringing new challenges to the security in Nigeria. We, we still have the same format of security process. Uh, we have not really changed to the extent where you would say that 
I can sit in my office and virtually see everything that's going on in, in the whole of my uh, client site. Yes, the pandemic has given us a challenge to begin to look into the future of security in Nigeria. As you know, thinking and action is not quite the same. And so there has been tremendous, tremendous improvement in the security uh, in Nigeria uh, before and after the pandemic, but uh, it hasn't actually affected the format, if you know what I mean. Uh, but the direction which it has given us to be able to, to look at security in new ways, we need to improve on the level and lay emphasis on virtual communication and security, which of course is affected by funding policies and the environment. We still have a long way to go in Nigeria, but with the willingness of the government to the extent uh, of uh, distributing resources to the security needs and also uh, getting us into the policies that will lead us to, to make all these changes, it would be a very good way to start. And, and so, yes, it, it has been a good uh, uh, opportunity for some of us uh, to, to improve on our security service uh, that we offer to our clients. It's been okay also in terms of uh, the new introductions that we had, but we need to be able to think about and improve technology uh, before another situation happens, because this is just a pandemic. And after the pandemic, who knows what else is going to happen as we have a lot of trigger happy scientists, if I may say, or uh, some controversies that we've been hearing on uh, the uh, pandemic not being natural, you know? And so uh, these are my thoughts uh, that we need to think into the future with modern uh, technology in Nigeria. Thank you. Paduka, thank you very much indeed. Interesting points there. And I'm sure we're going to come back and uh, um, tease out some of those issues once we've heard from our other panellists. Don't forget, audience, question and answer button at the bottom of your screen, and we'll endeavour to uh, incorporate your questions in the discussion. Right, let's go to Kabir and uh, ask Kabir your opening statement, please, Kabir. Um, thank you once again, um, Professor um, Gill. Um, the uh, index case of the uh, pandemic COVID-19 was recorded in Nigeria on February in February 2020. And then since then, um, Nigeria has recorded 167,000 thereabout, uh, precisely 167,543 confirmed cases. Um, out of that, it recorded 2,120 deaths. Now, um, to an outsider, this may, the figures would look really, really small compared to the figures that we've seen in the US, in Brazil, and in India as an example, and given the fact that Nigeria has a population of about 200 million. Um, now, why is this? On the one hand, it may be because uh, the, 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 rec the record keeping in Nigeria is not so good. And so unfortunately, not every death um, is investigated. Kabir, we've lost you. Kabir, could you um, turn your camera off, please, perhaps, and uh, um, we'll continue with just your voice. Um, can you? Yeah, we could. Maybe turn off your camera, Kabir, because you're you're coming in and out of uh, um, in and out of sound. Okay. Um, like I was saying, um, the, 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 the recording of deaths and the investigation of what led to it is not very good in Nigeria. And so for that reason, um, we, uh, the figures in Nigeria are really, really small. Now, the impact in the security sector have been um, one of new emergent um, threats. A good example is gender-based violence, where uh, especially during the lockdown, we saw an increase in gender-based violence. And then of course, um, the security were asked to implement, especially the lockdown and certain aspects of um, the uh, government imposed uh, protocols, uh, having advising people to wear the mask. So there, was, there were new rules as it were for the security agencies during the lockdown. Um, Again, we also saw a transformation of some of the existing security factors. A good example is in the Northeast, where the terror groups um, attributed COVID-19, the pandemic, to uh, you know, God's wrath and anger, as it were, on the people, and so used it as a recruitment tool uh, for ad additional 
membership, as it were, and largely uh, successful. Uh, unfortunately, we did not see any response by the Nigerian um, you know, security sector governance to that type of recruitment drive by, by the terrorist groups. Um, you know, with particular emphasis on, on, on um, terrorism. Uh, another example is fraud, especially, um, you know, uh, internet-based fraud, cyber fraud, where we also saw an increase. And this was obvious because of the lockdown and the transfer of um, people's attention on, towards the cyber space. All of a sudden, there was an increase in um, cyber fraud and other associated uh, fraud uh, practices. Um, the good thing in Nigeria was that Interpol was very responsive in terms of informing ahead of the types of trends in terms of um, cyber fraud and how the Nigerian police responded uh, to those um, cyber fraud. So in a very short period, there was an awareness and realization by uh, a majority of the Nigerian population on what the vulnerabilities were within the cyber space. And of course, that also led to a reduction in that. Um, so in a nutshell, these are some of the things we're seeing. Now, I, I would like to speak briefly around the role of the private security sector uh, to, um, you know, managing the pan pandemic and the consequences of, um, that it has presented to Nigeria. Uh, at, at the forefront of this effort is the private security sector. And that sector has, uh, has done quite well, both in terms of the provision of new technology that would manage the effect and consequences of COVID-19, as well as um, equipping its personnel to respond to the effects and consequences of um, COVID-19. Um, so I'll stop here, Martin, for now. And uh, perhaps um, when questions come up, I would respond to some other areas. Yeah, OK, Kabir, that will be great. I'm sure we we'll want to hear a little bit more about um, your thoughts on the private security sector. And we'll do that in the in the discussion that uh, takes place. Thank you, both of you. That was really good. Just to remind you, Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you, all audience, if you get your question in, we'll endeavour to incorporate it. That's after we've heard from our third panellist, though. So let's now go to Dowda. And Dowda, your opening thoughts, please. Yeah. Um, Martin, do we agree with me over here? When we, when the pandemic started, um, we we took it uh, to some extent. Some of us thought it was traditional, because um, you you see people trying to treat it the traditional way. When we all started, you see people putting concoctions together. It was later when the government came up, and we had a lot of uh, sensitizing our people. And now we, a lot of us have believed that the pandemic is here with us to stay. And now we have had the first uh, dose. We have also had the second dose just two weeks ago. Yesterday, the number of people that uh, were infected were just 11. Uh, from the top of the week till yesterday, the number has been dropping. Yes, the pandemic has changed the way we we do our things in Nigeria. But it has brought in a lot of awareness to our people. One, we, we have seen some the good, the bad, the ugly of it. The good of it is that we are able to do business now, just like we're having our meeting on Zoom. We're able to use more of the internet facilities that we have to do our business. I don't need to travel from one place to another, from Nigeria to Ghana, Nigeria to another part of the country, we go through Zoom, just make your time available and set your webinar and you have your program. So we have saved a lot of man hour in terms of traveling, in terms of cost, we have saved costs. So it has changed the way we do our business. My traveling expenses has reduced and I'm sure for a lot of us. But the bad of it is that because of the way uh, Kabiru said something, when there was a lockdown, there were a lot of uh, vices, there were a lot of uh, things that came up. But there was also something that came up. The, 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 the youthful minds that were on ground were doing, were going into a lot of internet fraud, cyber crimes, another form of crime, which of course we had seen at maybe less than 5% in the past, but now, we have had them, you know, tripled over the months because now 
they sit down, no work to do because there is a lockdown. Then now the kind of the, the, the trend has increased. So we have seen a new trend of business that these guys have gone in. The ugly part of it is that there is not just enough resources to put into what we are talking about. Because if you want to do uh, the proper security things, a lot of things must be put on ground for us to move on. So I'm sure as we continue the discussion, we, we need more of technology, we need more of training, we need more of interactions, and we need to share a lot of intelligence. So I'm sure as we go on, uh, we'll be able to give you one or two stories how we have moved on. Thank you very much indeed. Excellent. Now, let me um, um, uh, come to you with uh, a question that I really am keen to understand. And that is this, and I'll start with you, Paduka, if I might. Thinking okay. of the private security sector in Nigeria, what is it that needs to change now in order for things to be improved? And I'm going to come to Kabir and Dauda afterwards, but I can get each of your thoughts on the private security sector. What needs to change? What do we need to do now? Paduka. Thank you very much. Um, a good place to begin uh, we would have to be uh, to set up uh, a board, uh, basically a board to regulate the activities of the private security companies. And so the board will have a monitoring unit that will monitor all the policies and that will carry out and liaise with the uh, government agencies so that uh, they can have a single policy. And you know, everything begins with policy really uh, without a policy and framework, you, you cannot achieve uh, a lot of things that you would like to achieve. So uh, policy plays uh, a very important role. In fact, it's uh, the number one uh, determinant uh, and the framework too. The reality is that the role of the private security sector is limited to laws guiding their operations. And so the uh, national policy on security must take care of of all aspects of the security that the private security can tap into. And uh, from there, uh, the, the security uh, companies can uh, have uh, a good framework. But Baduka, is, is the security you. sector regulated uh, in, in Nigeria now? Are there, is yes, there... it, is, it is currently regulated by the Nigerian secu uh, uh, Civil Defense. Uh, yes, they are our regulators, uh, at the, and, and it's a federal license, of course. Uh, we gain the license from federal government, so it is regulated by the uh, Nigerian Security and Civil Defense Corp. Thank you. But, you. but you're saying it's not it's not good enough, the regulation? Yes, we are. Well, uh, if we have a board, then uh, the civil defense can be part uh, of the board, and, and the police as well can be part of the board. And so the board can then uh, uh, be able to independently uh, uh, carry out uh, the regulations of the security uh, uh, business in Nigeria. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Kabir, same question for you. In your view, what needs to happen now in order to see a step change in improvement in Nigerian security? Thank you, um, Professor Martin. Um, in simple terms, what um, the private security industry needs is standardization. Um, currently, that is totally lacking within um, the private security industry in Nigeria. You, you've got a range of what I would describe as very good um, providers and then uh, providers that are not so good. And they are operating in the same space uh, with no uh, you know, measurement by the receiver. And so that is affecting the quality of service that is being delivered. Um, they are being measured by the same standard. And just like um, the, uh, Baduka has mentioned, yes, the civil um, defense, which is a government department, is meant to regulate that. But then it has not provided um, a standard as it were. Um, second point is harmonization of um, the uh, kind of um, payment that uh, private security uh, sector is. Uh, being um, asked to, 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 to pay. So there are different levels of um, uh, charges by federal and sometimes even state uh, departments on the private security sector. And in an industry that is uh, battling with the consequences of the pan pandemic, that has also been at the receiving end of the standardized lack of sense of standardization. 
uh, it's sometimes very difficult for private security practitioners to survive. Um, a third point is the multiplicity of, um, I would say, policies that are not exactly harmonized. And so it's very easy sometimes for government departments to use sometimes laws that are not very clear against um, private security practitioners. A good example is the investigation. Um, sometimes the police would say private security industries cannot go into the area of investigation, uh, mainly because they are citing a law that says only the police can conduct investigations in the country. So also a very big area. A harmonization of this kind of laws with clarity, I think would help um, the sector in terms of its growth and its prospects. Um, the aspiration of the current um, Nigerian government to provide employment for youth is being uh, met by the private security industry in Nigeria. Unfortunately, that knowledge is not doesn't seem to be obvious to the Nigerian government. And so I think if the private security sector can come together on its own and present facts and evidence is true, monitoring and evaluation function within the sector itself, uh, and then come up with metrics to show to government of its capabilities, I think it would go a long way towards helping it grow. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. That makes sense, Kabir. Let me go to Dowda. Dowda, same question to you. Your thoughts on thinking of private security sector in Nigeria, what needs to happen now, next? Next, what we need to happen is to get a standard regulator. And um, we, we are clamoring for an agency so that it can be something like a private security, uh, private security industry, a regulatory agency or something. Because the truth is that uh, we have not had standards, just the way um, um, Madam said earlier on. There are new things that are coming up. I am of the association, and of course we are members, but we are doing some new things. We we need to get a standard in our training. We don't have we don't have one standard because we have guards that are trained to do the same work as in the banks, to go and work in the hotels, to go and work in residential houses. There is no standard. So we want standards to be put in place. These standards will help us to get it. In the last sensing of even getting of private security guards, we have had issues. Issues of what are the requirements that are supposed to be set for category A, category B, category C, what are the categories that we have? Because all of us cannot have the same kind of license and be doing the same kind of business. I'll give you an example. If you want to work in a bank, you want to specialize for security in a bank, you specialize. Then you go to the bank, they share the secrets of their, of their security network with you. And then you walk, you stay within that industry. If you want to work for the hotels, you stay within the entertainment industry. But we have seen where no standards, one company providing guards for hotels, providing for banks, providing for residents, providing for all the facet of our economy. That makes us no standard, jack of all trade. Then we also have the association that is trying to do it, but the association cannot do it all by itself because it's, it's just an association of uh, practitioners coming together. So if we have an agency in place, that for sure will help us to put our thoughts together and come up with a strong body. What we have now, as Buduka said, uh, Nigerian Security and Civil Defense Corps is not enough. We need an agency. They can be part of our board so that they can do the regulatory aspect of it. But to put the standards in place, uh, you need us. Some of the decisions about the industry is taken without members of the industry at that meeting. And then you don't have a true perspective of what goes on uh, at that meeting. So people just come up and they have, uh, like what um, Kabir said, there was the harmonization prizes and a lot of those. Yes, those are in the industry. But when you have standard, you take all those things out. What he has said is correct, but we need harmonization. And the way to go is for us to have a regulatory agency, which okay. is going to be controlled by us. Okay, makes sense. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, um, and interesting for me as an outsider. Let me go to questions now. And Dennis Shep, 
who is based in Canada and previously a panelist, by the way, um, and has got a question, a rather interesting one. He says, have criminals, now perhaps I'll come to you first, Baduka. He's trying to understand about whether the pandemic has been used by criminals to do anything that's particularly new, particularly different. So you were saying earlier that some crimes have gone up, some crimes have gone up. Is that because they are being particularly innovative uh, um, or because there are more of them or what? So I go to Baduka first and I'll come to Kabir. Baduka first. So yes, uh, uh, physical, both physical security and cyber security uh, have posed more threats uh, than ever to us, really. And um, we, we, we would naturally uh, have uh, uh, been able to, to, to have data on, on, on the effect of cyber security in Nigeria as a whole. Uh, but it's not only Nigeria, it's worldwide, really. So people uh, have gone into more crimes and and these crimes uh, we we we've had some in the past uh, and it's not like they're all uh, so very new because loss of jobs and redundancies of staff in the private sector of the economy uh, has led to abject poverty with an attendant uh, rise in the criminality banditry kidnap hostage taking cattle rustling molestation of the girl child and cyber crime. Uh, we we would therefore really uh, require security companies to deploy devices such as drones, CCTV cameras, among others, in tracking these hoodlums because there are uh, more hoodlums than ever in in the region. And is it? But what I guess the thing is, Paduka. Before I go to Kabir, why are there more? Well. Poverty, uh, you, you know, uh, the, the pandemic really has caused uh, a lot of people to be displaced. Uh, basically, we have lots of jobs and people who not naturally would go out every day to fend for themselves uh, no longer have that, you know. And, and we have uh, quite a lot of other issues with the, the farmers not be able to farm in their farms. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, around uh, the Niger Delta, uh, the bushes are occupied by these militants and you cannot go to the farm really. And uh, people are hungry. People uh, are having to buy uh, a food uh, at a very expensive rate. Uh, three weeks ago, the price of Gary has gone up from uh, a bag for 20,000 to 30,000. So the jump really, and, and people can no longer provide uh, for themselves uh, really. And as a country, it's a big problem for all of us. We, we need to, uh, look into food security uh, critically. The government needs to uh, take a decisive action on what to do about food security. So people are hungry and they're hungry and angry. A hungry man is an angry man, I would say. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, interesting answer. Kabir, same for you. Um, Dennis Shep's interested to know about um, what's going on with regards to criminals and the way they're behaving. Um, so, uh, the, there, there are two um, sort of responses, I would say, to, to, to that question. One is the direct um, impact of um, COVID-19 on criminality in Nigeria. Uh, and so, um, you know, just like um, Baduka has mentioned, we've seen uh, a rise in inflation uh, to an extent even um, unemployment. The last fig uh, figures by the Bureau of Statistics in Nigeria gave that 3% of um, uh, 200 million, uh, coming to around 40 million Nigerians that are either unemployed, underemployed, or in some instances, um, in circumstances that can be described as, as unemployed. So uh, the correlation between that and criminality appears to be very positive. Um, the second element is the impact that the new rules of security agencies in either enforcing um, the COVID-19 protocols or in some instances, managing some of the security challenges that have arisen as a result, the result of COVID-19, um, creating gaps that are being exploited by these, these criminals. So as an example, we've seen a rise in gang violence and associated to criminality with those types of gang activities in almost all parts of the country. Uh, banditry has um, increased, even though uh, studies have not directly investigated why we've seen an increase in banditry, but there is 
anecdotal evidence to suggest that it could be because of the impact on the economy, the impact of the pandemic on the economy. Social upheaval has also increased. Um, also, as we okay, Kabir, thank you very much. You, we've lost. Oh, you're back, Kabir. You you disappeared, Kabir, for a few seconds. So, um, uh, yeah. so you just talking. So, um, final point is on yes. Um, Okay, go ahead, um, Professor Martin. No, carry on. So you, you said you had a final point. Just say your final point. Kabir, we've lost you. We've lost you. We'll come back to you in a minute. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll go to Dowder. And Dowder, Dennis Shep is asking about offenders and criminals and about how they're behaving and what's different or new about their behaviour. Why is it going so high? Dowder? Um, Martin, do you agree? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Carry on. Okay. You, 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 you will be, you will agree with me that we have had increase in the crime wave and how, um, criminals are behaving. Um, it's, it's, it's a new world order because what we have over here is that there are there are a lot of things that we have seen in the recent past that have not been there in the past. I'll give you one or two examples. One is we have had agitations here in Nigeria of several types. We have had, we have had agitations from the, we have had iPod, we have had the Boko Haram set, we have had uh, the new uh, trend of um, kidnappers, we have had people that have been, you know, were led on their way from one state to another. Movement is now very difficult. In Nigeria, before we have, we, we, we travel, we make our trips at night because it's cool and it's quiet. Now you can't do that again. The roads are deserted. So for you to make a trip, of an hour or two, that is less than 200 kilometers, you will find out that you put a lot of security men on the road so that you can, they can be able to safeguard those facilities like the road. And you find out that as the government is doing that, we don't have enough manpower to cater for other parts of the country that needs uh, this insecurity. From where I stay, a polytechnic was attacked and the students were, were taken away. And that has brought a lot of fear because people can stand up to criminals before, but now they cannot because they are more sophisticated. Now they have guns. Now they, there is uh, the problem we have here of uh, light weapons going from one hand to another. Criminals seem to have more of these uh, arms and ammunition in their possession. Yeah, because because you Dada, know what's happening. Dada, can I ask you a question just on this point? Simon Chan has said. Yes, please go ahead. Because his, on this very issue, Simon Chan has says uh, um, uh, uh, it often appears there's an arms race between criminals and security and police, um, and he's saying, is that the case in Nigeria? It's true. Okay. Okay, and who's winning? Well, the if you can hear me, yes. the country, the, the, the government have just set up a committee that we look out for uh, to stop the provocation of uh, small uh, light weapons and uh, uh, small arms and light weapons in Nigeria to see how uh, they will be able to 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 retract some of these weapons that are in the hands of criminals and in the hands of citizens that are not supposed to. If you are supposed to carry an arm or you have a possession your ammunition, you must have a license and you must be trained to know when to use them. And you must be in your right, right frame of mind to have those ammunitions. But what we have right now is, is, is in a bad condition where we have everyone that uh, wants to perpetrate crime can easily have access to these uh, ammunitions and arms which is a bad thing to do. So each time they want to, to perpetrate their evil deeds, they have access to these 
uh, uh, weapons, either hot weapons or cold weapons, whatever you call them, they have access to them and they can use it on the populace, which is a very, very bad um, uh, development that we have here. So yeah, access to light weapons, to, yeah. Okay, Dada, thank you very much indeed. I want to move on because I want to get another question, if I might, Dada. Um, um, Baduka, back to you. And Gordon Knight says, uh, um, what do you feel will help to improve the relationship between private security and the police and, uh, um, and government safety? So what's, what will improve the relationship between private security and the police? If I could ask you to be brief, Baduka, because I want to get Kabir and I want to get uh, Dada in on this and we're running out of time. Okay, uh, so where to begin is uh, the collaboration. And in collaboration, you have to uh, define the relationship uh, and the command unit really. So if we, we, we partner with the police, there must be uh, 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 spelled out uh, collaboration terms and condition of who needs to do what and when uh, that needs to happen. And uh, in, in, in going back to, to, to going back on that as well, I would say that we have quite a, a number of uh, ex-service uh, personnel who, who can fill in uh, some of these gaps between uh, the, the, the gaps we have in, in security issues uh, in the country. But so collaboration uh, is a good way to start with regards to uh, improving and uh, the, the relationship between the police and the private security and education as well. There must be an uh, there must be education to to really uh, uh, factor in all the things that uh, uh, the relationship entails. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Well, let me go to um, um, Kabir now. And Kabir, the question is: um, Is there a relationship between private security and the police? And and from your point of view. What makes yeah, um, it problematic, Kabir? We can't hear you, Kabir, unfortunately. Kabir, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll, I'll, I'll go to Delta first and I'll come back to you. Hopefully we can we can solve the connection problems with you, Kabir. We can't hear you. But Delta, so a question for you. Um, it's um, um, Gordon Knight's question, Delta, and he's asking about the relationship with the police. And as Paduka says this needs to be based on some sort of understanding and some sort of terms of conditions. Could you uh, could you just clarify for us, Dalda? Um, what's what's the nature of the relationship between private security and the police in Nigeria? Is it a good one? Well, the it, it's not. Is uh, why I say it's not um, outrightly is because we are not being regulated by the Nigerian police force. We are regulated by Nigerian Security and Civil Defense Corps. So we don't have a direct dealing with um, the Nigerian police. So that, that brings me back to the, the, the earlier recommendation of us having an agency. If we have an agency, a regulatory agency, which could be, as I said earlier, which could be a private security industry a regulatory agency. That agency will have the Nigerian police on its board. We have uh, people from the Nigerian Security and Civil Defense Corps. We'll also have people from the NSA office and maybe from the presidency. Then we now have our own uh, people from our industry also on the board. So when you, when you discuss at the board level, the board members carry whatever resolutions that have been made back home to wherever agency they are coming from. So we need, we need uh, an agency so that we can be able to work. We don't report to the police. We don't give uh, deep information to them because we have an, a regulatory body that is in between us and the Nigerian police. So we need truly to be closer with the Nigerian police and also uh, to deliver the mandates of so many things because in the new act, the police, the police is the only one that has been uh, allowed to carry out things like investigations, and we don't have that. But in our in our work, our daily uh, assignments, we are supposed to do this. So having a third party in between is where we are having some of these challenges. Thank so you. So there must be need for improvement of the relationship and more collaboration. 
Thank you very much indeed. Um, Kabir, I'm so keen to see if we can get an answer from you. Can um, So it's this point about the relationship with the police. So Paducah and uh, uh, um, Dowder have been making the point that there's a lack of structure uh, at the moment. So right now, where is the relationship with the police? Do you do joint operations? Um, do people move from one agency to the next? What's the nature of it, Kabir? Um, so I agree totally with um, both Baduka and, and Dauda um, in terms of the lack of structure. But then where I think we differ is um, the responsibility for the creation of that structure, I think should lie with us, um, the private security practitioners. Unfortunately, um, where I am at the moment, um, I also provide um, consultancy service to the Senate, and that is the body that creates the lo laws in Nigeria. And uh, I'm privy to uh, information that we're very divided in terms of the kind of submissions I see coming to the National Assembly for the creation of um, different structures to guide and monitor security services in Nigeria. So the onus, I would think, is more on our side for us as a private security body to come together, agree that we, we should be united, agree on the kind of services we want to provide, agree on what we want from the government side, and then more importantly, what we can provide. I mentioned earlier on um, metrics. Uh, I mean, it was very difficult for you to uh, provide the number of um, personnel that is being employed by the private sector today. Nobody has that, that number. But I know that it's probably above 10, 10 million or, or there about, given the number of man, man guards and then several other services that have been provided by um, the, the private security sector. So if we have that kind of numbers, um, government would listen to us, but it would only listen to us if we do the presentation jointly and not independently as, as I'm seeing at, at the moment. Um, the second element is um, the quality of services that we are also providing. Um, again, that, that brings us to standardization. Um, so if we agree as a group and then self-regulate ourselves in terms of the quality of services that we will provide, and then that would also um, reassure government because um, we know, and if we are truthful to ourselves, there are uh, among us companies that even we would not recruit or uh, engage because of the shoddy nature of the services they are, they are providing. So. Kabir, we just lost you again. Uh, can you try turning off the camera, Kabir? Because I'd like to catch your final comments if I could. Kabir? We've lost you. We've lost you. And we're running out of time. Listen, let me say thank you very much indeed, Kabir. Um, um, fascinating. I'll tell you what we could have gone. On this last point, what was particularly striking is, of course, the problem you're facing in Nigeria is exactly the same problem that's being faced elsewhere in the world. So you're not alone. And other countries that have got regimes have sometimes felt the regimes themselves aren't good enough for the job. And uh, um, Kabir's point that the industry needs to come together seems to make so much sense. It's just not easy to do. But listen, thank you very much indeed, panel, for your expert insights. Really, really enjoyed that. Don't forget a copy of this recording and a blog I will write about what our panelists have been saying will be on the website tomorrow. Uh, and don't forget that uh, um, we will be joining up and uh, hopefully we'll all be at Securex next May. I'm very grateful to Securex. They've been a big supporter of uh, this webinar today. And uh, they were very, very supportive of getting our panelists on board. Um, and of course, they're involved in the next presentation. So I'm going to say thank you very much indeed to Kabir, Baduka uh, and Dowder. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Very much to, uh, uh, enjoyed your, 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 your insights. Uh, and with within one sweet breath, we go from talking about the uh, um, side of the situation in Nigerian security to talking about the OSPAs. Now, uh, um, I'm hoping that I'm going to have in the background there uh, um, two of my great colleagues who I will introduce in a minute. Uh, I just, if I would, just like to say a few words about uh, um, about the uh, uh, about the OSPAs. You know, one of the uh, one of the interesting things that we've all got to, to face as we go forward is that all around the world there's interested in this this uh, uh, idea that security needs to be better, and in order to get better, 
one of the things that becomes really, really important is that we uh, um, identify those who are doing a good job. So here we are at the Ospers and welcome everyone. And I would like to begin uh, this Ospers uh, award ceremony here in Nigeria by spending just a moment to update you on the international Ospers, what's been going on around the world. And as you will see from this slide, we are expanding around the globe. And let me tell you a little secret. We're about to announce four more countries. They should be announced soon. Uh, but also I want to talk to you about the Cyber Oscars. Now, um, these were launched earlier this year. These awards are specifically about cybersecurity and they're open to companies and individuals working in any area of cybersecurity anywhere in the world. So if you're working in cybersecurity, do let people know about the Cyber Oscars. Entries are open now. There's still plenty of time to enter. So go to the website and find out more. You can go to thecyberospers.com. Now the time has come to reveal the finalists and winners of the 2021 Nigerian Ospers. And I would first of all like to thank our event partner, SecureX West Africa, and our global trophy and certificate sponsor, Edith Cowan University. Uh, also the judges who kindly gave up their time to independently score the entries against set criteria. Now the important point about the judges I just want to say is we're very grateful that they represent different associations uh, and they've all agreed to mark to an ethics policy and uh, um, they've taken their job extremely seriously. And the idea of the Oscars, you don't just win, you've got to convince the judges. And the judges are all marking independently against the set criteria. Um, so uh, I'd also like to thank all the associations who supported the awards. Uh, um, they're very, very important to us, uh, uh, as well as uh, um, uh, uh, Security Meet First magazine. Thank you very much indeed for uh, uh, um, your, your, your input. And we'd like a little mention for our Nigerian colleagues. Wilson Esenbedego, Raymond, Raymond Abaji, and Thomas Uduo. Udu uh, I would like to extend my personal thanks to all of them. And as it happens, Raymond and Thomas will be assisting me in announcing the finalists and revealing the 2021 winners. Now, throughout these proceedings and afterwards, we will be sharing all the details about the awards with our international followers on social media. Please also do the same using these hashtags. So use these hashtags and let's tell the world because all around the world right now, there are people waiting to see who are the winners in Nigeria. So some of the, the summaries of all the winners, uh, which include judges comments will be updated to the Nigeria website immediately after this webinar. So without further ado, let's reveal who the 2021 winners are. So the first award we are presenting is for Outstanding In-House Security Manager or Director. Now this award recognizes those who through security expertise, business acumen and or innovative leadership have led with distinction. And I'm going to hand over to Raymond now to read out the list of the finalists. Raymond, over to you. Our finalists for this category are as follows. One, Hilda Daffe of Cummins, Middle East. Two, Victoria Nkemdi Bohi of Coca-Cola, DC, Nigeria. Three, Brian Roberts, Notor Chemicals Industries, PLC. Thank you very much indeed. I appreciate that, Raymond. Now I'm going to ask Thomas to reveal who the winner of the Outstanding In-House Security Manager or Director is. Thomas, welcome. Over to you. Yes. And the winner is Victoria Nkendelem Ogbefu of Kokotola, Egypt, Nigeria. Many congratulations to Victoria. Outstanding performance. You really, really did very, very well against tough opposition. And don't forget, Victoria, we will be in contact with you about presenting your trophy a bit more at the end. 
but also details on the website straight after this webinar about why Victoria was the winner. But congratulations to all the competition. That was a tough category to win. Now, moving on to the award for the Outstanding Contract Security Guarding Company. Now, this OSPA acknowledges those who are outstanding suppliers of manned security guarding, making a positive difference, recognizing the distinct importance of frontline leadership, motivating staff, managing resources, forging partnerships, and just some of the qualities the judges are looking for. Now, Raymond is going to tell you who the finalists are. So, Raymond, over to you. The finalists category are as follows. One, Evergreen Protective Services, Halogen Security Company, Nigeria Limited. Number three, Marshall Star Security, Nigeria Limited. Thank you very much indeed, Raymond. And uh, Thomas, please could you do us the honor of announcing the winner of the Outstanding Contract Security Guarding Company. And the winner is, is Allogen's Security Company Nigeria Limited. Fantastic. Isn't, isn't that, aren't, aren't the clapping and the music good? I've got to thank uh, Christine <laughs> and Hannah Miller for putting this together like that. Um, well done, Halogen. Very, very, very well done. Um, impressive performance in the Ospers Halogen Security. Uh, um, don't forget, details of the uh, why you won and what the judges said will be available on the Ospers website straight after this webinar. Now for the Outstanding Installer Integrator category which recognizes companies and individuals who excel at security installations. Raymond, over to you to read out those who have been shortlisted. The finalists are as follows. One, Albert Halogen. Two, Cones Engineering Limited. Three, Red Leaf Solutions Limited. Thank you, Raymond. Appreciate that. Well done, finalists. Now then, let's reveal who the Outstanding Installer Integrator category winner is. Thomas, over to you. And the winner is Red Leaf Solution Limited. Many congratulations, Red Leaf Solutions. Don't forget to look on the website afterwards. You'll see the reasons why you won and judges' comments. So look forward to that on the website straight after this webinar. Okay, so uh, um, we come to our final award category for this year. Uh, obviously, we're virtual for a reason, uh, as you will understand. And the final award goes to the Outstanding Young Security Professional which recognizes a security professional under the age of 40 who has excelled and made an impact and is laying the foundation for an outstanding career in security. So without further ado, let's go to Raymond and ask Raymond to read out a list of the finalists. Ladies and gentlemen, the rising stars are as follows. Olá, Dr. Paul. Dr. Aden, Limited, number two. Avril, Eyewu Edero, IHS Towers. Three, Rex Uche Ndubuisi Mwankwa, IASP. Thank you very much indeed, Ramos. Really appreciate your uh, um, skillful pronunciation. And uh, Thomas, can you tell us who the outstanding rising star is? And the winner of the 2021 Outstanding Young Security Professional is Evel Eruro Edero of the IHL Tower. Well done, Avril. Fantastic performance. Uh, very, very impressed. Don't forget, you can find out more details about why you won by looking on the website after this webinar has finished. Well, before we close, Let's congratulate all the winners one more time. And that concludes the presentation of the 2021 Nigerian Outstanding Security Performance Awards. Our Nigerian colleagues will be in touch to organize 
for you to be presented with the trophy. Uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, um, the Securex team have agreed that we can go uh, send the trophies to Securex offices in Nigeria, and we'll ask you to pop by the office, pick up your uh, trophy, and we'll get a photograph of you, which we'll then put on the website. So in the world of virtual, that's what we've got to do. So thank you very much indeed for doing that. And uh, brand new trophies, by the way, look out for those. Also, can, can I just also congratulate all the finalists? Um, uh, Ospers are about giving yourself a chance. And just by being a finalist, it meant that you had an achievement. And you do get a logo, which you can use just for being a finalist. And thank you to all our judges, supporting associations, to Raymond, Thomas and Wilson for helping us not just present the awards, but helping us out in Nigeria. And to Securex West Africa for partnering with us. Hopefully their event in May next year will be a physical one. A reminder that summaries of our winners' achievements can be found on the website, and don't forget to promote using social media. So finally, a big thank you to, for, to you from the OSPAs and Securitex teams for being part of today's event. And we look forward to welcoming you to Securitex Secure Secure Voice Africa show in May 2022. Until then, wherever you are in the world, stay safe. <laughs>